Good morning and welcome to Sunday Morning Worship at Forest Hills. My name's Fish and I have a few brief announcements that I'd love to share with you before we get started today. This afternoon at 4 p.m. in the sanctuary, we'll host our Summer in the Psalms Night of Worship and Family Gathering. It'll feature special music led by our Sanctuary Worship Choir and Band. We'll take the Lord's Supper together, celebrate several things the Lord is doing in and through our church, and take a few moments for a brief business meeting before enjoying some delicious ice cream dessert and fellowship. Next Sunday, August 7th, is Promotion Sunday, where all of our preschoolers, kids, and students will have fun moving up to their respective age or grade level Sunday school classes. And any adults who haven't yet plugged into a Sunday school group are encouraged to stop by the Welcome Center in the atrium, where several of our ministers and guest services team will be available to help you to find a group. In fact, you can access a new fall Sunday school guide on our website right now at fhbc.org slash Sunday school. Then looking ahead, we have an incredible menu of Bible studies, discipleship classes, and more as part of our FHBC weekdays relaunch. But before that begins, I want to invite you to our fall kickoff carnival on Wednesday, August 10th, right here in the church parking lot surrounding our student center. Loads of free food and fun for the whole family, in addition to opportunities to talk with several of our ministers and ask questions about our fall midweek activities and studies for all ages, which get started the next week on Wednesday, August 17th. Learn more about our Disciple You for Preschoolers and Kids, which is introducing some new, fun, interactive updates. Connect for middle and high school students, beginning with a ReConnect event featuring a gospel storytelling illusionist and equip FHBC and several other Bible studies for adults. Discover more at fhbc.org slash weekdays. Well, that's all I've got, and it's time for worship to begin. Remember, details on everything I've shared, plus even more, is inside today's bulletin, which is also accessible on our website and our cool and easy-to-use mobile app. We're so glad that you've joined us for worship today at Forest Hills Baptist Church. Good morning. We are especially excited about uh, this evening as we gather at 4 o'clock, as you heard Fish say, for a time of worship uh, a time of celebration and a time of business as, as the church gathers together to, to conduct the Lord's business here at Forest Hills. We serve a great God. Imagine the God who created the oceans, the mountains, knows us, knows us by name, and cares for us, cares for our families, cares for our children more than we ever could. Let us worship that great God. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ. Let's stand as we sing, please, together.
Amen. Be seated, please. People all over the world want to be connected to God in their mind. They want to be connected to God, the divine. Folks, there is one way to be connected to God the Creator. That is through the person of Jesus Christ. Hear the words from Colossians 1, 15 through 20. Christ is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For everything was created by him in heaven and on earth, the visible and the invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and by him all things hold together. Christ is also the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Christ, and through him, to reconcile everything to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Let's continue to worship as we sing, Glorious is thy name, O God. Let's stand. Good morning, church family. Welcome to worship at Forest Hills Baptist Church, where our mission is to glorify God by making gospel-centered disciples who love, grow, serve, and go. My name is Jake Day. I serve here as the pastor, associate pastor of administration. 
and it's my privilege again to welcome you. If you are new today especially, I'd like to ask you to fill out a connection card. There's one in the seat in front of you, or you can scan the QR code there with your phone, and you can fill out electronically. That helps us get to know you a little bit better and allows us to follow up with you this week if we need to. If you are new today, if this is your first time or second time, if you're a visitor, I want to encourage you to take that connection card when we're done with this service out to our welcome center right out here. We've got a gift for you, and you'll have the opportunity to meet Kenneth Bonnet, our Connections Minister. Uh, again, we just want to welcome you with open arms, and that is an easy way for us to do that. Well, if you can believe it, school is going to be back in session this Friday. Can I get an amen from the parents? Amen. <laughs> Before we turn the page, though, on the summer and we look forward to the fall, I want to encourage you, like Wayne said and David before him, to come tonight to our family gathering and night of worship. You're going to get an opportunity to hear this choir and band perform and sing some great songs, some hymns and some of the psalms that we have been walking through this summer. And it's going to be a refreshing and nourishing time for your soul. In addition to covering some regular church business, we're also going to take some time to uh, uh, observe the Lord's Supper. And it's just going to be a really special time. So again, come back tonight at 4 o'clock right here in the sanctuary, all right? And before we uh, continue worshiping today, I want to remind you that the ministries of Forest Hills Baptist Church only happen through the Lord's power and through your giving. And so giving is an act of worship. And I want to encourage you today, uh, as you leave this uh, space, there are boxes where you can place your gift. You can always give online. Again, we thank you so much for the generous gifts, the tithes, and the offerings that you give to the Lord through Forest Hills Baptist Church. Let me pray, and we'll continue in worship. Lord Jesus, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house today. There's no better place that we could be amongst other believers, saints, fellow Christians. God, we pray for those in this room, though, who may not have yet joined not only this church family, but, Lord, especially this faith, this, the, the faith family that is the church, Big C, through, like Wayne was saying, through your son, Jesus Christ. And so, God, we pray today that the Holy Spirit would be active and moving, as we know he already is, but especially convicting us of our sin and turning our eyes and our hearts towards you. Father, we thank you. We bless you. In your name we pray. Amen. Yeah. 
Our only response is to surrender our lives, our will, everything we have. To the God who loved us so much, he sent his son. I surrender all, all to Jesus. sophomore going to Franklin High School. So before I went to camp, um, I went on the LA missionary trip. And Miss Jennifer, minivan mom, she was asking me if I was going to camp. She said, you should go. It's like, everybody's going to go. It's going to be fun. And so I decided to text mom. And I said, I want to go to camp. So Miss Jennifer, thank you. First night, we went to worship, and we listened to the song, Royalty. And I heard the song, and then it kind of like hit me that I needed God. Ashley was around me. And I looked at her, and I'm like, I want to be baptized. She said, okay, and she talked to me about it. And then we went to small group after that night. The next day, we went to worship, and the preacher asked us to stand up, who needs to take forgiveness. I stood up, and they asked me who I wanted to talk to, and I said, Miss Rebecca. So me and Miss Rebecca, we walked out, and we were standing outside, and she said, have you, ex have you ever like asked for forgiveness? And I said, yes, but when I was like in fourth grade in Georgia, I asked her if we could do it again. So we were praying and asking for forgiveness, and she walked me through it. Since camp and the big step that I've taken in my life, I feel that God's gonna be there. God's going to guide me through the path that I need to take. God has a plan for me. And also, I've noticed in my prayer life that I'm more one-on-one -on -one with God. I'm more direct with Him, that He's going to be my number one in my life. We're all sinners. Jesus plays a role in each one of our lives. You just have to keep believing that he's gonna be there no matter how many times you fall. If there's anybody who doesn't know Jesus, I hope you take away from the story that I've got to share with y'all. And I hope that you get to take your steps the same way I get to take mine. Can we put our hands together in praise to the Lord for his goodness and his grace? <clears throat> what he has done and what he has doing.
for his grace that changes everything and for the opportunity we have to live in that grace and to share that grace. That's what we want to talk about the next three weeks together as we begin a new series today called Simple. As we begin our new church year, as we wrap up the summer, as we look ahead to all that God has for us, we want to talk about three things that oftentimes we overcomplicate, but in the economy of God are often more simple than we think. Uh, to begin uh, today, I want you to think of somebody that, that you might be very familiar with, and for others, uh, you might not be quite as familiar with, but you've probably heard the name Coach John Wooden. Anybody ever heard of John Wooden? Certainly, most have. Legendary UCLA men's basketball coach, 664 wins and over 80% winning percentage in his career, 10 national championships in 12 years, including winning seven in a row from 1967 to 1973, a feat that uh, no one has come close to uh, matching. At one point, his team won 88 consecutive games. He was the Henry Iba National Coach of the Year, a record seven times, and could have been many, many more. He coached many of the all-time greatest college basketball players and Teams, including Kareem Abdul-Jabbar and Bill Walton. Every year, the best players in the country wanted to play for Coach Wooden at UCLA, and he would bring in his pick of the recruiting class, and you would have them come into that locker room as new freshmen joining in with this star-studded team, and they would realize that Coach Wooden did the same thing every year. He was a creature of habit. He had a stack of three by five index cards that guided every practice, every drill, every philosophy that he believed in. At the end of a season, he would just cycle back to card number one and start over. And every year, every season, every team, no matter how great the team had been, no matter how great the team was gonna be, no matter how great the recruits were that were joining the team, the first practice, started with the exact same lesson how to tie your shoes how to tie your shoes he would walk through literally how to put your socks on beginning at your toes and working across your foot and smoothing out all of the wrinkles bringing them up just high enough on the calf then how to lace up your shoes Appropriately and get your foot in them and how to tie your shoes so that they would not come untied or so you would not get a blister in the game. Here's what he would say. If you get a blister in a big game, you're gonna suffer. That doesn't happen here. Your shoes can come untied during a close game if not done properly. We prepare the little things to allow us to focus on the big things. As one player said, by the time the games came along, they were just memorized exhibitions of brilliance that started with how to tie your shoes. Now, you would think the best basketball players in America already pretty well knew how to tie their shoes and how to put on their socks, right? But Coach John Wooden did not assume even the simplest thing. He taught it. He modeled it. And he repeated it over and over and over and over and i don't think anybody would argue with that level of simplicity and repetition in the same way for us who are followers of jesus we simply cannot assume the gospel coach wooden didn't assume that the best basketball players in america knew how to put socks on and tie shoes we cannot assume the gospel. Billy Graham, at the height of his ministry, seeing people come to Christ in droves, remarked, and obviously this is unscientific, but Billy Graham said it, so science doesn't really matter at that point, right? Billy Graham said that he estimates half the people that sit in a church every week are on their way towards a Christless eternity because they don't understand the gospel. 
We've heard story after story, right? People who would give a story that might sound like this. Well, I grew up around church or my parents went to church and at an early age, I walked an aisle, I filled out a card, I took a step, I did something. But then later on in my life, I realized I didn't understand the gospel. I didn't understand what it meant. Or maybe somebody that is pr practicing religion, but they don't understand grace. Or maybe that's even your story. I mean, that's even your story. One of the most startling moments for me early on in ministry is when we were planting a church in Columbia, South Carolina, and the first two people that came to faith in Christ, one, when I met him, he was a self-proclaimed hardened atheist, wanted nothing to do with the things of God, had not been around church, had not grown up in church, had not had anybody share anything with him about the Bible, gospel, Jesus, nothing. He knew nothing, he had nothing except his hardened belief that there was no God. And over many weeks and months and conversations and lots of coffee, I watched the Lord tear those walls down. And that young man gave his life to Christ. Not long after he gave his life to Christ, we were having a gathering on an Easter Sunday. It was before our church even formally had launched. But we had a worship gathering that particular Sunday because people that were joining together to begin this new church wanted to invite their friends that didn't know Jesus to come and hear the gospel. And so we had all these people here that were there at the in invitation of, of people that had many recently come to Christ. Many were part of a church for the very first time. And so you're expecting like maybe some people will hear the gospel for the first time and come to faith in Christ. But actually the person who responded to the gospel that day was a gentleman that was in his mid-60s that had been around church his entire life and had never fully, truly understood the gospel until that Easter Sunday. He came back at the end of the service. We were having a baptism following that service and he came back and he said to me, I need to give my life to Christ. I've never understood what I now understand. I need to give my life to Christ. I thought I had before, but now I know that I had not. And he gave his life to Christ at that moment. And you know what? That crazy guy got baptized in his clothes. His Easter clothes. His good stuff. He didn't even care. He didn't even care. Went home soaking wet, but saved by grace. If someone walked up to you this afternoon at lunch and asked, what is the gospel? Could you answer it? Could you answer the question? The reality is, for a lot of us, we could not, or we would struggle and I want us to be absolutely clear for our own relationship with Jesus and for our ability to share this with others, I want us to be absolutely clear on what the gospel is. I want you to see it today. I want you to see how simple it is. I want you to know it and believe it. I want you to be able to live it. And I want you to be equipped to share it. So in the vein of John Wooden, this is the gospel. Turn in your Bibles, if you would, to Genesis chapter 1. Easiest chapter in the Bible to find, right? You don't have to be a Bible person to find Genesis 1. Just open it up. There it is, right? Get past a few introductory pages and you will be there. Got a little different approach today for those that are new to Forest Hills, maybe here for the first time. Typically what we do in a sermon is we will walk through a text of Scripture and, and unpack the meaning of that text and seek to apply it into our lives. In fact, the big thing we're doing throughout this year is walking through the book of Acts. We've taken a break for the summertime, but in two weeks we're going to start back again as we end the simple series. We're going to jump back into Acts chapter 13, but today is going to be a little different. Rather than focusing on one passage of Scripture, we're going to kind of walk through several chunks of Scripture through Genesis 1 to 3 to help us understand with clarity what the gospel is. Is. Now, the sermon notes look a little bit different this week as well, so rather than just having some fill-in-the-blanks, you got to do some art, okay? you got to do some drawing. 
So it's going to come up on the screen so you'll know what to be drawing and how to fill in blanks and all those other kind of fun things. And here's what I want to ask, that everybody participates today, okay? This is an all skate. Everybody's in, and the music's starting, and here we go. Genesis 1, verse 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now the earth was formless and empty. Darkness covered the surface of the watery depths, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the surface of the waters. Within those first words of the Bible, we are introduced to the main character of the Bible, and it is God. All attention is on him. He's the focus. He's the entirety of the point. Everything that he makes and everything that he does is meant to point us back to him. It's why out of nothing he creates everything and all he needed to do it was his word. If we get this truth right, the rest of the Bible makes sense because that's the thread that runs throughout. God is the point, not us. All the focus is on him, not us. Everything is meant to point back to him. And everything that he's made and everything that he does is meant to point us back to him. And his word is alive and powerful and able to do exactly what he wants. When we understand this, the Bible makes sense, but also our lives make sense. Our lives make sense when we understand that we are not in the supreme throne room of our lives, but the one who made us is. That we are in, in control of very, 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 very little but he's in control of everything. While we are limited, he is absolutely unlimited. It's why the psalmist says in Psalm 24, verse 1 and 2, that the earth and everything in it, the world and all of its inhabitants, belong to the Lord, for he laid its foundation on the seas, and he established it on the rivers. He makes everything from nothing, and it is all good. That word good that appears there, in Genesis 1 and is repeated often is the word meaning as it should be. What God made, he made it as it should be. All of creation as it should be. But that was just a warm-up for what was to come. Look down a little further to verse 26 and 27. Then God said, this is after he's made everything, he speaks and the, and the sky lights up. He speaks and the earth is covered with vegetation. He speaks and the waters and the oceans come about. He speaks and all of creation comes into being. In verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. They'll rule the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, the livestock, the whole earth, creatures that crawl on the earth. So God created man in his own image, created him in the image of God. He created them male and female God is speaking his desire to create his image bearer the us hour in Genesis 1 26 27 is not speaking of multiple gods could be a literary device kind of like somebody says you know hey what do you think about having lunch together this afternoon and you say in response well we'll see who's the wheel you're the one who's answering right who's the who's the wheel it's just the plural right mom and m's i guess right something like that but what we understand biblically is to refer to is the trinity that present in creation god the father is creating the spirit of god is hovering and indwelling giving life god the son jesus as john and paul would say was there all things were made by him and through him and for him. The pinnacle of God's creation is man and woman created in his image for a unique relationship with him that no other part of creation has access to. That's why Genesis 1, verse 31, the summary statement of God's creation, God saw all that he made and it was very good indeed. Not just good, but very good. Not just as it should be, but completely as it should be. And we see this as it should be harmony brought together in Genesis 2, verse 20 to 22 and verse 25. Skip down to that. 
The man gave names to all the livestock, to the birds of the sky, to every wild animal, but for the man, no helper was found corresponding to him. God looked at Adam, whom he had made, and said, it is not good for man to be alone. He already knew, ladies. He already knew, all right? So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to come over the man, and he slept. God took one of his ribs, closed the flesh at that place. Then the Lord God made the rib he had taken from the man into a woman and brought her to the man. In verse 23, he says, at last, this is who I've been waiting on. Thank goodness Adam made the right choice, right? And that the bird or the warthog or whatever else didn't do, right? But God made woman, and then here is the very goodness of God's creation in verse 25. The man and his wife were naked, yet they felt no shame. The very as it should be of God's creation is that man and woman created in God's image, unique, glorious relationship with God, naked and unashamed. You know what that meant? It's not just speaking of their physical state, it's speaking of their spiritual and relational state. The very goodness of God. The very goodness of God's creation is on display here. You know why? Because they have nothing to hide and no shame before God or one another. All, all of creation is in harmony such that God is bringing before Adam all that he has made, all of these wild beasts, all of the livestock, all the animals, and saying, will this work? Will this work? Will this work? Will this be a suitable helper? How about this? And, and of course, it's not. The Lord fashions woman, beautiful, glorious, all of her splendor, the majesty of God on display, male, female, all of creation harmoniously working together in peace, so much so that there was nothing to hide before God and there was nothing to hide before one another. All of this is radiating back to the one who made it all as a chorus of worship Adam and Eve didn't stand there in the perfection of God's creation and say wow look what we've done they didn't stand there and say oh wow look at the work that we have brought about Adam did not look at Eve and say, oh, man wow look what I've done not at all all of it was a chorus of worship the chirping of the birds the wind rustling through the leaves the harmonious, peaceful, perfect relationship of man and woman, husband and wife, all of it was a chorus of worship. This is God's creation. This is his intent. This is what he has made. It sounds like a dream, doesn't it? It's not a dream. It's God's design. And that's what I want you to write in your first circle there to the left. God's design. This is how God designed the world to function. All things functioning together for his glory. His design and his creative intent, his majesty fully evident in creation, in humans, in the relationship between male and female, in the uniqueness of roles between male and female, in the marriage, the leaving and cleaving of man and woman joined together in marriage the way God designed, the only way God designed. And ultimately, evidenced in a perfect, no shame relationship with God. It sounds like a dream because we know that's not the way the world operates today. We know that's not the way our lives operate today. Rather than the perfection of this peace, this harmony, this rest, this freedom, what our world feels like, what our lives feel like, what even sometimes our marriages and our families feel like is not, not the perfection and the beauty of God's design. It feels more like brokenness. That's what I want you to write in the second circle, just over to the right. Write the word brokenness. Brokenness says there is no peace. But instead of peace and fulfillment, there's emptiness, there's loss, there's shame, and there's guilt. And we feel that. 
And when we feel that emptiness, we feel that void, we feel the shame, we feel the loss, we try to fill it. That's why Augustine said that there's a void in us that we spend our lives trying to fill until we find our ultimate rest in him. We try to fill that emptiness. We try to absolve the shame and the brokenness that we feel, often with substances or activities that maybe become addictions because in order to fill some measure of peace, we have to have the substance. We have to have this activity. God is not enough. We have to have something else. We try to fill that brokenness with other relationships, even at the compromise of our marriage relationship. Whether that be through a computer screen or it be through real life, we think there has to be someone better. There has to be something better because this is just not doing it for me anymore. We throw ourselves into gaining more wealth and power thinking if I can just live like these people live, if I can have the authority that those people have, if we can go the places that those folks can go, if I can drive what they can drive, then all will be well. The ache of my soul and my heart will be satisfied. However, when we give ourselves to these pursuits, instead of filling and satisfying, we find ourselves experiencing only more shame, more emptiness. And so we keep going deeper and deeper and deeper. To evidence this pursuit, I want you to draw, and you'll see this on the screen, draw some little squiggly lines coming out of that circle, brokenness. It's evidence of all the ways that we try to pursue to fill this void. We know something's not right. We know something has broken. We fill it deep in us. We long to fill that void. Sometimes we hit the bottom and wonder what in the world has happened. What's happened to me? What's happened to my marriage? What's happened to my mind? What's happened to my heart? What has happened? The question is, how do we get from God's perfect design to this, to brokenness? How did we get there? I want you to draw an arrow between those two circles that you filled in right now, connecting from God's design over to brokenness. And I want you to write over top or underneath that arrow the word that the Bible has for how we get from God's design to brokenness. It's a word called sin. It's sin. Genesis 3, 1 to 7 helps us see where sin came from. Remember, we left off at the end of chapter 2, naked and unashamed, no shame before God, no shame before one another, but then something happens. Chapter 3, the serpent was the most cunning of all the wild animals that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees in the garden, But about the fruit of the tree in the middle of the garden, God said you must not eat it or touch it or you will die. No, you will certainly not die, the serpent said to the woman. In fact, God knows that when you eat it, your eyes are going to be opened. You'll be like God. You'll perfectly know good and evil. The woman saw the tree was good for food, delightful to look at. It was desirable for obtaining wisdom. And so she took some of its fruit and she ate it. She also gave to her husband who was with her and he ate it. And the eyes of both of them were open, and they knew suddenly now what? They're naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. We get a picture of Satan's tactics, of how he lures us into brokenness and deeper and deeper into brokenness. He starts off by getting us to question God's word. Did God really say? Did God really say male and female? Leave and cleave together? One woman, one man for eternity. Did God really say that? Did God really say that he is the one who will provide, that he is the one who made you and loves you and will rule over your life for his glory? You can trust him. Did he really say he's the same yesterday, today, and forever? Did he really say that his faithfulness is great and his mercies are made new every morning? Did he really say that you can cast your cares upon him because he cares for you? Did he really say and after questioning god's word he gets us to deny god's word oh you won't die no 
no no no no no it won't be that bad in fact he wants you to reverse god's word to say actually my eyes are going to be open because god's holding out on me so much can i not trust him he's holding out there's something good he's got good stuff held in the back and he's not bringing it out for me so i've got to go get it myself aha i got him i got him i'm going to do my life my way because he's been holding out i'm going to do marriage my way because he's been holding out i'm, I'm going to pursue all these things that i want to pursue because he's been holding out the result everything comes unraveled eve should have never eaten adam should have stepped up and protected they both sinned they both fell and the result was brokenness evidenced just a little while longer in cain and abel Cain's jealousy leads him to kill his brother. Genesis 6, the world's gone completely mad. And in chapter 6, verse 5, God says, all the thoughts of man are evil all the time. All the thoughts of man are evil all the time. So, so mad did the world get that God said, I'm sending a flood to wipe the whole thing out and press reset. Noah, Noah, you're the only one who's righteous. Would you build a boat gather up all the things that i've made so that creation can be preserved but i have to press reset when we feel the weight of brokenness in our lives and we feel the weight of brokenness in the world we know things are not right we know things are way not right and it causes us to wonder can this ever be made right again can this ever be made right again an earthly dilemma of this magnitude friends requires a heavenly solution because we don't have one in and of ourselves that's why in genesis 3 god offers a window of hope it's like a painting y'all remember the painter thomas kincaid they call him the painter of light you know why kincaid would would take a canvas and he would paint a dark mountain range and on that mountain range, he would, he would paint snow that made you just feel cold as you looked at it, right? You could feel it. Dark, weighty, cold, kind of like winters in Nashville. But it never happens here. And then he would paint this little cabin out there all by itself. There's no neighbors. There's no, there's no swimming pool, country club, HOA, none of those things. There's this little cabin. Middle of this big old dark black mountain, snow on top of it, dark clouds all around. And on the front of that cabin would be a couple of little uh, windows. And in the corner of one of those little windows, Kincaid would take his gold brush and put a little candlelight in that window. And it would change the whole complexion of the painting. All right? A little window of hope. A little window of light in the darkness. Genesis 1 1 gives us one of those. That is, even in the darkness of your life, the God who made you is there. The God who's there in the darkness before creation before he made all that there is he was there and he's still there and even in the darkness of your life and mine he's there but then in genesis 3 15 we get this window of hope that god gives us and something that he's promising to do he says i will put hostility between you he's speaking to the serpent between you and the woman between your offspring and her offspring he will strike your head and you will strike his heel God is promising to send one through the line of Eve at some point in time who will successfully defeat the serpent. Where Adam and Eve failed, this one who's coming will succeed. Scholars call this the proto euangelion What in the world does that mean? It means the first announcement of good news. It means the first announcement of good news because guess what? That's what gospel is. It's good news. In that third circle, write the word gospel. 
The gospel is good news, life-changing news, world-changing news, never going to be the same news. God is giving that, the first announcement of that, that through the line of Eve, one is coming who will successfully defeat the serpent. And we see it fulfilled in Jesus that though the serpent bruised his heel while he hung and suffered and bled on a cross, he crushed his head when he walked out of the grave alive on Sunday. The author of Hebrews says, and we sang it in the song Power of the Cross, that through his death, Jesus crushed the power of death and the devil who brings it about. That's why Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, death, where is your sting? It's gone because there's victory available to us now, not in us, but in Christ who conquered sin and death. What will this Savior do? This one who's coming, he will cover our sin now look at this other little window of hope in genesis 3 verse 21 this is at the end god has pronounced all of his final words to adam and eve they're having to leave the garden but as they're leaving god makes a provision verse 21 the lord made clothing from skins for the man and his wife and he clothed them or some translations will say he covered them what did god do well there was a sacrifice how do you get skins from an animal apart from the sacrifice of the animal? There was a sacrifice and blood was shed. Why? So that Adam and Eve could be covered. And it foreshadows a lamb who will come and who will be sacrificed. And his blood will be shed. Why? So that sinful, broken people like you and me can be covered and the unending stream of the grace and mercy of our God. It sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Almost too good to be true. Wait, you mean I've rebelled against the one who made me? I've twisted his word, make it say what I want it to say and be able to do whatever I want to do, but yet he then steps in and at great cost, his son, he's made a way that my sin and my brokenness can be covered. How in the world do I get that? What do I have to do? What must I do to earn this and to receive this? Well, the Bible has two words for that. It's the words repent and believe. I want you to draw an arrow from that brokenness circle over to gospel. How do you get from brokenness to the good news of the gospel? It's by repenting and believing when jesus began his ministry he said the time is fulfilled the kingdom of god is at hand that means the time that god promised in the garden has fulfilled here i am the kingdom of god is at hand repent and believe the gospel is what he said in mark chapter 1 verse 15 romans 10 9 and 10 paul says it this way if you confess with your mouth that jesus is lord believe in your heart that god raised him from the dead you will be saved rescued one believes with the heart resulting in righteousness and one confesses with the mouth resulting in salvation it's believing i can't save myself but he can i can't do the work that's necessary for me to be made right with god and rescued from brokenness but he did we confess i am a sinner in need of a savior and the only one who can save me is jesus and Romans 10, 13 says this, that everyone, everybody say everyone, who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord, believing in their heart that Jesus is the Savior they need, confessing with their mouth, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And 2 Peter 3, 9 says this, the Lord does not delay his promise, as some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but for all to come to repentance. Our great God is so gracious and so merciful that he is patient with you and me. And he continues to hold out to us the hope of the gospel that we might turn from our sin and turn from our selfish ways and turn from all the things that we pursue to try to fill the void brokenness has brought in our hearts and our lives 
that we might repent and turn to the one who can save us and forgive us and make us whole and make us clean and give us life. He is gracious and he is patient. When we repent and believe this gospel, then finally we are able by the Spirit's empowerment through the grace of God to recover and pursue God's design again. I want you to draw a final arrow from, bro, uh, from gospel to God's design and write the words recover and pursue. When we repent and believe the gospel, the Spirit of God comes to live inside. We are saved, we are rescued, we are reconciled, and we spend the rest of our lives until Jesus calls us home or until he returns, recovering and pursuing God's good design. Ephesians 2 says it this way, for you're saved by grace through faith. This is not from yourselves, it is God's gift, not from work so that no one can boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared ahead of time for us to do it's grace alone faith alone in christ alone and as a result the bible says that you and i are his workmanship trophies of his grace masterpieces of his mercy created to do good things that god prepared long before that we could walk in the good works that he's called us to walk in not perfect but always progressing for the rest of our lives until Jesus says, behold, I've come to make all things new. God's design. Everything's perfect as it should be and we are unashamed before one another and before him. But in our sin, we have rebelled against God's way. We've questioned him and we've turned and twisted his word to do our thing. It leads us to brokenness. And in our brokenness, we give ourselves over to any number of efforts to try to fill the void we feel in our hearts and our souls. But we eventually come to the place to recognize the only way that void can be filled is through the good news of what God has done for us in and through his son, Jesus. And upon hearing, we repent and believe this gospel that this is the only Savior. And as we do, God is good and gracious to forgive us, to live inside of us, and to empower us to recover and pursue his original design for our lives as his workmanship. Friends, that is the gospel. Here's the question. Where are you? Where are you in this? Are you in that place of brokenness? Where the need you have is for a Savior who will rescue and fill you. You can repent and believe today and be transformed. Maybe you've given your life to Christ. But right now, your life does not reflect a life that is recovering and pursuing. It reflects a life that's gone backwards. Back into sin, back into brokenness, back into rebellion. The good news of the gospel is that you could confess your sin and be forgiven and be restored to righteousness. Or maybe you believe this, you've received it and you're living it, but it's time for you to be bold about sharing it because there's somebody who's close to you but far from God that needs to hear it. As we have a time of invitation and response, I want to earnestly plead with you to respond to the call of God on your life today. This is the day the Lord has made. This is the day of salvation. Friends, we do not know if we have another. If you are not a follower of Jesus today, do not delay. The Lord is patient, the Lord is gracious, and he has you here to hear this because you need to take a step. If you're not walking rightly with the Lord right now and you need to confess and repent of sin, do not leave here without taking that step. If the Lord has burdened your heart for somebody close to you but far from God, cry out to the Lord on their behalf and ask the Lord to empower and use you to share this with them. You've got it on your sermon notes now and you know how to do it. 
I'm going to pray. Our worship team is going to lead us. And we're going to have a time of response. Our encouragers will be around the room. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the power and the simplicity of the gospel. that you've made a way to rescue us from our brokenness and to give us life, to give us forgiveness and grace. That we can walk as your workmanship and the good works that you've planned and your original design for us to walk in and live in. Thank you, Jesus. Brokenness is not the final answer. Death is not even the final answer, but in you, it's grace and life. For those that don't know you today, for those that are unsure of where they stand with you, God, I pray that today would be their day of salvation. I pray even for one who would repent and believe. Lord, for the one that knows you but is not walking with you, thank you that your grace does not end. It's everlasting and it's rich. Help us to turn to you, to repent and find your grace that restores and forgives. For we who know you and are walking with you, but we're not sharing this message. God, burden us, break us, and call us now to cry out. Father, this is a holy moment, and you're with us. As you are patient, help us, God, to not delay in receiving what you are offering to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his glory. Amen. Let's stand. Respond as the Lord is leading you this morning. We'll be here. grateful today for the simplicity of the gospel and the power of the gospel that saves and I'm grateful for the simplicity of that song that all we have to do is say yes and repent and believe the Lord is working in your life I say it all the time you are not confined to these few moments at the end of a service to respond if God is moving and God is working on your way to Sunday school grab somebody take your Sunday school teacher when you get there and say hey I need to talk Grab somebody in your class and say, I need to talk. If you're not in a Sunday school class, come to the Welcome Center. We'd love to get you plugged into one. We've got a lot of them, and they're great. And we'd love to have you be connected in there and be part of growing in faith with others. If you're new to Forest Hills, we'd love to connect with you after the service. Kenneth Bonnet and our team will be at the Welcome Center. Come by and see us. We've got a gift for you. We'd love to say hello. And want to invite, especially our church family, those of you that are members here at Forest Hills, back tonight. But, but it's open to anybody to come for our night of worship right here in this space choir and worship team will be leading us it'll be a tremendous punctuation to the summer and then we'll have some time together as a church family celebrating communion celebrating the good news of what we just preached and talked about this morning i hope you will be here and be a part of that i want to ask everybody if you would just have a seat for a quick moment i want to recognize our associate pastor for missions and mobilization uh chad mize if he would come and uh, lead us in a special introduction this morning. As you know, at the beginning of this year, we adopted a set of goals. Uh, one of those goals was to launch a mission residency where prayerfully the Lord would use Forest Hills to pour into, invest in, and send out 
the next generation of ministers and leaders the hope of the gospel. God has answered our prayer and he's given us the opportunity to welcome two ministry residents to our church beginning now. So Pastor Chad, lead us in that and then lead us uh, to close out our service today. Amen. Church family, it is a privilege of mine to share with you just God's faithfulness and how he has answered our prayer. You know, as our church really adopted that goal back in November, I began praying, we began praying, God, send us the people you want us to invest in, that you're preparing to do work for your kingdom, whether it's here or among the nations. And so God's been faithful to answer our prayer. I want to introduce you two folks today that have become dear to me, and I know they'll be dear to you over the next couple of years. So first to my right is Micah Stevens. Mike is from Johnson City, Tennessee, graduate of East Tennessee State University. He's been a huge part of our BCM there, where we've had a great relationship over a number of years. He's married to Tori for the last couple weeks. Uh, three weeks? Uh, yeah, two. Two, two, two. 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 So, I exciting. That's not a good start. Love it. Well, not only do we get to be a part of their journey, but we get to be a part of their new family. So we're so thankful for what God's doing in their lives. And he'll be serving kind of as a pastoral resident with the initial focus in college ministry, working with Matt Longworth. So we're really thrilled that uh, he'll be with us. They'll both be taking classes, Micah and Monica, who I'll introduce you in a minute, which you probably already know, at Southeastern Seminary beginning this month. So we're grateful for Micah. And that leads me to Monica. And you guys know Monica Hutchison, married to Camden. Uh, who's been a part of our team for many years. But Monica, over the last couple of years, though she's graduated Belmont, has just incredible gifts in the area of music and worship leading, has served faithfully with our student ministry, leading them as young worship leaders. And she's felt God calling her into worship ministry. And so we're thankful that she began to pursue what God may have for her and that and God led her to our ministry residency. And so we're thankful that Monica is going to be our worship ministry resident for the next two years. So put your hands together and just celebrating what God's doing with Micah and Monica. Why don't we do this? Let's take a, a special moment here and just pray over these two that have said, Yes, Lord, I feel you calling me into ministry in your church, whether it be in the local church or among the nations, wherever God places them, and they've given their yes, and we want to just pray that God would just direct step by step. So pray with me if you would. Lord, I thank you for, uh, Lord, for Micah, for Monica, for their families, and Lord, I pray, God, just your hand of blessing, protection, provision, and empowerment would be heavy upon God, we pray against anything the enemy would want to do to disrupt the calling you've placed on their lives. Lord, the ministry path you have set them on, we pray, God, against that in the name of Jesus, Lord, and pray that you would just uphold them and, Lord, just be their step-by-step, -step, Lord, their guide, their shepherd, Lord, that's watching after them, their front guard, their rear guard, and, Lord, that you would just bless this journey. Lord, as they serve our church family, Lord, as you pour into their lives, Lord, theologically, and, God, I pray that... Um, God, you would just allow our church family to be a huge blessing to them. God, would you bless this journey for your glory, or that your name might be known both in Nashville and among the nations. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed.